Good morning, good afternoon to all the participants in this webinar from our webinar series Control Alt Delete Green Rebuild that the AFC, the International Finance Corporation, the arm of the World Bank Group that supports the development of the private sector in emerging markets, has launched in the context of the current crisis COVID-19. As a call to action, especially to the financial and the banking sector for a green recovery after. I am Carlos Serrano. I am the program manager for the IFC Green Banking Academy. The knowledge and capacity building initiative that IFC has clients, commercial banks and financial institutions in the transformational journey from banking to responsible and green banking. We support banks beyond financing uh, with advisory services and with, uh, capacity building, training, and all the knowledge necessary for that transformational <coughs> journey. Climate change and sustainability, speaking, is one of the top priorities of the World Bank Group. And it is also a priority for the world itself. Now we have the commitment that more than one of every three loans that we provide has to be green. Used for green purposes, and this, I bet you, will increase over time. Climate change is a major disruption for the world, and this is particularly the case also for the banking sector. Climate risk beyond environmental and social risk is already reshaping the banking sector risk management infrastructure and frameworks as climate is a major and financial risk, but also a substantial business opportunity. There is a huge gap in climate finance flows. Now the total global climate funds stand at $600 billion, driving particularly by investments in renewable energy. But actions still falls far short of what is needed under the 1.5 degree centigrade scenario. Estimates of the investment required to achieve a low carbon transition range from 1.6 trillion to 3.8 trillion US dollars annually up to 200, uh, 2050 for supply side uh, energy system investments alone. Banks are starting to align their business model and strategies with the sustainable uh, development goals and particularly its climate related targets. Now, let me share with you why we have brand our webinar series as control Alt delete green rebuild control because if we move and act, we can control the future of the world. We all like to live in alt because we trust there are better alternatives for channeling financing flows and for building a more sustainable society. And delete because we shall erase the mistakes we did in the past to avoid them in the future. In summary, we are proposing a green reboot. Today, for the closing of this first phase of our webinar series, we have a fantastic webinar under the title of Professor Guillen's new book to be launched on August 25th. The title is 2030 how today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything. There is no better way to close our webinar series. Last 12 weeks, we have shared with our audience a call to action to react and reshape the future and build a better, more sustainable future for all of us. Mauro is going to help us navigate the biggest global trends that are impacting us, and he will share his views on how everything is already changing. Some logistics about today, we will run for about 50 minutes from now. Mauro will share a presentation for about 30 minutes to be followed by 15, 20 minutes for responding questions that I will do and that we also expect to receive from our audience. So please attend this, post any questions to Professor Guillen in the question and answer section in the WebEx and we will reach questions to Mauro. We would also appreciate if you can please take a few seconds at the end to help us improve by completing a short question online survey that you will see online on the screen. Many thanks for that. So without introduce our distinguished uh, uh, guest today, Professor Mauro Guillen 
is one of the most original thinkers at Wharton School, where he holds the Thantman Professorship in International Management, and he teaches in its flagship Advanced Management Program and many other courses for executives, MBAs, and undergraduates. Mauro is in reality a major expert on global trends, uh, global market trends, and he's a sought after speaker and consultant. So we are really grateful, Mauro, and truly delighted to have you with us. Mauro combines his training as a sociologist at Yale and as a business economist in his native Spain to met method method methodically identify and quantify the most promising opportunities at the intersection of demographic, economic, and technological development. His online classes on Coursera and EDX have attracted over 100,000 participants from around the world. Mr. Guillenio's book, 2030, How Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Reshape the Future of Everything, will be published over the next with translations into nine different languages. And we invite you to get it to review in further detail what we are going to discuss here today. With my opening remarks, now I have the pleasure to turn it over to Professor Guillén and kick off your presentation. But I have a question for you about your own professional future, Mauro. Yeah. Years in globalization, uh, do you think that you still have a job going forward? Or will you need to reinvent yourself and an expert in reversal globalization? Let us know, and the floor is yours, Mauro. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carlos, for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you for organizing this event. But I think you've put your finger on precisely what I think is the issue. I think um, too many pundits, too many experts, um, you know, and you see this in the media, are essentially assuming that because of what's going on now, we're entering uh, a new period in history one in which globalization will suddenly disappear. And I disagree, of course, with that statement. Uh, I think uh, to a very large extent depends on how we're defining globalization, but it also depends on how do you anticipate that things may change as a result of this pandemic and of the crisis uh, that have been triggered by the pandemic. Um, so I would like to essentially use the next uh, 20 or 25 minutes uh, with your permission, Carlos, to explain that point of view. And uh, precisely that will be my last <clears throat> slide in the presentation, which is, um, you know, I'm going to try to persuade you that um, globalization is actually here with us to stay uh, and that uh, we have to be very careful about how we manage it in the future. So I'm going to start sharing the slides and uh, uh, please let me know if, uh, for whatever reason, they are not uh, visible. And of course, uh, the slides will be made available, so no need for you to take uh, screenshots. Uh, please let me know if uh, the sound is not okay or the image is not okay. Uh, so the title of the presentation is Trends 2030 After the Pandemic. And let me just begin by saying that there are different types of crises, okay? There are turning points and there are accelerations of existing trends. I would like to persuade you today that the situation that we're in the middle of right now represents an acceleration of pre-existing trends for the most part. It is not a turning point where there is a before and an after. Like for example, we saw with the Black Death in the 1300s. Remember, you know, it was a brutal pandemic. Uh, between 40 and 60% of the European population passed away. And as a result, there was a sudden increase in wages and the high wage economy started to develop. Economic historians actually refer to the Black Death as the beginning or the first uh, you know, step towards the Industrial Revolution, which of course took place 400 years later. Uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, I think is also a turning point because we saw a change in paradigm, right? Uh, punctuated, of course, by a brutal World War II. Um, and I think also the stagflation crisis of the 1970s was a turning point because I think uh, the period of globalization that we're in right now originates really in the 1970s, especially 
in some of its characteristics, such as financial globalization. Um, but again, I think uh, there are other types of crises that represents more like an intensification of pre-existing trends. I would put in that category, definitely, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, where we saw that economic globalization in terms of trade and investment recovered very quickly, continuing the trend. We also saw that financial globalization also recovered and that the geoeconomic balance in the world continued along a pre-existing trend with the rise of emerging economies. So I'm gonna put COVID-19 with a question mark for now in this second category of crisis that represents accelerations. Um, but let me just uh, tell you how I'm going to be approaching the subject matter. Uh, I would like to first tell you about demographic trends. And I want to establish here some continuity before the pandemic and after the pandemic, because I strongly believe that demographic trends are going to reshape the entire world over the next 10 years or so. And then I would like to uh, bring to your attention something that you're very familiar with, which is the rise of the middle class in emerging markets and how this may change as a result of this pandemic. And then lastly, I would like to return to the question that Carlos posed at the beginning, which is, are we gonna see the end of globalization? Or by contrast, are we going to see an intensification of globalization as a result of this crisis. So let me begin with something that I think you're familiar with, which is fertility. So this is the number of children that women have over their reproductive lives. That's what we're measuring here vertically. We can see, if you can see my mouse, okay, the pointer of my mouse. And then uh, horizontally, we have the time scale between 1950 and the year 2019 is actual data. And then the rest are the medium forecasts from the United Nations. And as you can see, there is a very general trend throughout the world, which is that fertility has been dropping, even in the least developed parts of the world, and that's Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of the Middle East, and parts of South Asia, primarily. There's also a decline, but of course, from a very high level, meaning that whereas nowadays, women on average in the least developed parts of the world have four and a half children, in the more developed parts of the world, Europe, United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, we're actually, we have been for a long time below replacement level. Uh, and the replacement level, as you know, is normally believed to be about 2.1 children per woman to account for children that don't survive and also children that never have children themselves. <clears throat> now, let me point out something really important. This is forecasts published by the United Nations before the pandemic. In a moment, I'm going to give you a sense as to I, what I think is going to happen to these curves once we account for the effect of the pandemic. But before I leave this slide, I want to show you that actually in the developed world, since the year more or less 2000, you see a slight increase in fertility, right? In the number of children per woman, which is actually contrary to the global trend of a decline, right? The global trend, as you can see here in the world, is one of decline. And the reason there was this slight increase, which is projected to continue, right? Since the year 2000, is because of primarily immigration. Immigrant families tend to have more children on average, at least during the first generation. And as a result of that, what we see is primarily in the United States and also in some European countries like France, a slight increase in fertility. So that's what was going on. Let's see now what is likely to happen with fertility as a result of COVID-19. Well, I just want to make two points, okay? We still don't know. We need to collect the numbers. We will see in a few months what happened in 2020. But you see, recessions, economic recessions, tend to lower fertility. And the reason is that people, when they see uncertainty, when they lose their jobs, when they feel that they have to save money for the future, what they do is they postpone having babies. That doesn't mean that they don't end up having the number of babies that they want to have but they postpone having them. And as you very well know, the mere postponement of fertility decisions causes the fertility rate to go down. The other reason why the fertility rate, especially in Europe and the United States, is gonna go down in the next uh, you know, few months and years 
is because of lower levels of immigration. Lower immigration because of protectionism, because of nationalism, because of populism, and also lower rates of immigration because the economy in the US and Europe is not doing that well, and therefore many immigrants won't see a benefit from migrating at this point. Now, another thing that we should think about very carefully is the one-child policy, which as you know, has been phased out in China. Remember, there was a gender imbalance that um, was produced as a result of that, about 20% more boys than girls. That affected internal savings behavior, as has been very well documented in the uh, articles that I mentioned at the bottom of the slide. And then what happened? Well, China had an excess amount of savings, which they exported, so to speak, to other countries, such as the United States, which needed those savings. And that essentially fueled consumption here. Well, this is going to come to an end. Both the demography is changing, but also, of course, the relationship between the US and China. So that's one side of the equation. What's going on with the number of babies born? The other side of the equation is life expectancy. And as you know, the trend has been that life expectancy at birth has been growing in every region of the world. Now notice that the most important thing about this chart, okay, which again has actual data until the year 2019, and then what you have is forecasts, medium forecasts from the United Nations, is that, as you can see, the gap between the richest and the poorest countries in the world was about 30 years after World War II, but today is only about 17 years. And that gap will continue to shrink. And that is also going to rebalance the demography in the world, okay? Now, what's gonna happen to life expectancy growth as a result of the pandemic? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. This pandemic, so far, we're approaching 750,000 deaths, okay? Now, this could go up, but quite frankly, I don't think it's going to reach the level of another pandemic that is still going on, HIV AIDS, 25 to 35 million people so far, okay? Or, of course, the 2019-2019 flu H1N1 pandemic, which killed an estimated 40 to 50 million people. So I would like to be optimistic. I think there are reasons for being optimistic. I don't think this pandemic will reach that level of other previous pandemics. So I think, of course, there's going to be excess mortality, especially in the higher age groups as a result of this pandemic. But the impact, I think, will be that it will reduce okay, future gains in life expectancy as opposed to reversing those gains in life expectancy. So once again, the trend will continue. It will be momentarily, temporarily slowed down by the pandemic. And notice very well, this is the third point that I have here, that excess mortality due to COVID-19 is likely to be greater in the US and in Europe than in most emerging and developing markets. With, I think, the exception of Latin America, unfortunately, Look at Peru, look at Brazil, look at Mexico, what's going on over there on a per capita basis. Even Chile, right, is among the top 10 countries in terms of deaths right now as a percentage of the population. Uh, and perhaps India, but definitely not China, definitely not Southeast Asia, all of those big countries over there. So what's going to happen then? Before we get to the arrows here, um, what you see here is what percentage of the population measured vertically, so everything here is relative, was in the past, is today, or will be in the future, right, in different parts of the world, assuming current levels of migration. And here, of course, what we're using is the projections for fertility and for life expectancy that I showed you earlier. Look at how quickly the world is going to change with Africa becoming very soon the second biggest part of the world in terms of population by the year 2030. The blue line here is a year, a little bit before the year 2030. And you see the leveling off of South Central Asia, which includes India. You, hear, you see the very rapid decline of East Asia and China, and also Europe, right? So what's gonna happen as a result of the pandemic? Well, in a nutshell, is that you see those curves crossing over in the year or approaching the year 2030. What we're gonna see is that these curves are gonna cross each other two or three years earlier. 
So Carlos, going back to my book, my only regret now is that instead of titling the book 2030, I should have used the title 2027, because most of these changes are going to happen earlier. Why? Because this pandemic is accelerating pre-existing trends. How is this accelerating them? Well, Africa, relatively speaking, will be bigger because the pandemic, at least so far, is not having the same effect there as it is having in other parts of the world. And also, we're going to see that Europe in particular, but also parts of Asia, they're going to see the percentages go down a little bit because of the effect of the pandemic. So therefore, the future is going to arrive a little bit earlier as a result of this pandemic. Now, let me also tell you about specific generational groups and what might happen to them over the next few years, especially as a result of this pandemic, something that I think we need to watch. You see, the age group between 15 and 35 is, roughly speaking, what we've been calling the millennials. And I think we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to this generation, but not for the reasons that normal people think, because they are consumers and blah, blah, blah. It's because this is the second big crisis that this generation has to face during their adult life. The first one, of course, was the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. The second one is the recession induced by COVID-19. They're going to be in a very different labor market after this pandemic, with much higher levels of unemployment in many countries, with increased incentives for automation, not just in the manufacturing sector, but primarily in the service sector. And during the q and I would be very happy to give you examples of that. And also with something that is changing the labor market, which is increased preferences for remote work. But we're also going to see important generational changes in the population about age 60, which, as you know, is growing everywhere in the world, even in the developing world. Well, this is going to be the largest consumer segment of the market defined by age. Think about that again. For the first time in history, the population above age 60, it's going to be the biggest segment in consumer markets in the world. By the way, in the United States, this segment owns 80% of the net worth. And the average in the world is about 50 to 60% of the net worth. Why? Well, because they have homes. They have other goods. Maybe they have savings. They have, uh, in other words, um, things that uh, other population age groups don't have. Now, as a result of COVID-19, as you hear here at the bottom, there is somewhat of a negative wealth effect. But as you can see from the evolution of stock markets, at least so far, much of that has been wiped out. There is excess mortality in that age group. And I'm not going to deny that and also the potential flight from urban areas of that population because of the enhanced health risk. But other than that, this is going to be something really important to watch, these intergenerational dynamics. And notice another one that is really important. The other generation, millennials, they may start asking a lot of questions about the level of debt. Don't get me wrong. I think we should engage in government spending to get the economy out of the problem, out of the recession. However, this is going to create very important intergenerational issues and conflicts as a result of rising government debt. One trend that I think will get reversed, at least in Europe and the United States, so this is the one trend that I think will get reversed, is urbanization. But I don't think this is going to happen, however, in Sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia or in the Middle East. So cities right now, represent about 1% of the land area in the world, but they are home to 55% of the population, and they account for 80% of the carbon emissions. So I know that your group is very interested in climate change. Look, there's no solution to climate change without addressing the problem of urbanization, right? It is climate change and urban problem, primarily. Now, I think COVID-19, of course, makes cities less attractive. I mean, New York right now. And I can tell you the city is deserted. There's almost no one. There's no tourists and there's no commuters. Social distancing and remote work, I think, is going to have a large impact, at least for the next two or three years in some of these cities. But quite frankly, most of the growth in the world in terms of cities 
is taking place elsewhere. It's not in the US or in Europe. Look at this map with the largest cities in the year 2014. And now I'm gonna show you the map, the exact same map with the projection, the median projection by the UN for the year 2030, which is only 10 years away. Look at the growth of cities. If you look at the change in the map, as I oscillate between one and the other, it's mostly growing in a little bit Latin America, but most of the growth is Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, look at India, and also South and East Asia, okay? So I don't think that growth is gonna be necessarily reversed by this pandemic in those parts of the world, but I do see, and I will be very happy to answer questions about this, I think there will be a reconfiguration of the urban, suburban, rural axis in Europe and the United States. Now, this brings me to remote work. What's going on with remote work? Well, you can read the slides. I think after five months of experience, we're all very, very aware of both the advantages and the disadvantages of remote work. And I think increasingly people are realizing the disadvantages and so are companies. So I think that in the end, we're gonna have kind of hybrid arrangement whereby, yes, we're gonna have a little bit more remote work because perhaps many of us will work from the home one or two days a week. But I think it's unsustainable to believe that we're gonna go on forever working from the home, those of us who have the privilege to do so. But let me tell you something about globalization and remote work that is of great concern to me. As you know, there is trade in goods, there's trade in services, and there's also trade in tasks. Another term for trading tasks is offshoring of tasks. So let me give you a couple of examples. A radiologist in some part of the world interprets an X-ray taken of a patient in a completely different part of the world. As you know, this has already been going on for the last few years. Another example, which is very common by now, is a computer programmer creating code that then gets integrated into the project that some other programmers are pursuing in some other part of the world. Or a professor like myself, I could be hired for a few hours by, let's say, another university in Australia, and I could deliver right, a lecture. That is trade in tasks. You see, before this pandemic, here in the United States, 37% of all jobs could be undertaken by the worker, by the employee, completely from the home. And that's what has happened, right? Now we have about a third of the labor force working from home as a result of this pandemic. Well, the moment you can perform jobs from the home, they can be performed from any home anywhere in the world. So you're opening up the possibility for trading tasks, meaning Carlos is now sitting in Spain, right? As I understand it, he can perform his job from over there. Or maybe the IFC would think, oh, we're paying Carlos too much money. Let's hire somebody somewhere else to do the same job. By the same token, Carlos is a very skilled and experienced worker. So maybe somebody else in the world, not necessarily in Spain or in Washington, D.C., may call Carlos and say, we want to hire you. And by the way, you don't have to move. You can perform your duties from wherever you want to be. And by the way, we believe that you have very unique skills, so we're going to pay you more money. So what I'm trying to say is that if we continue with remote work, we're going to see the emergence of a global labor market, at least for certain types of jobs. This will be bad for certain workers who don't have unique skills or experience. It will be, as usual, very good for other workers who have unique skills or unique experiences. So let's see what happens. But again, my prediction is that if we continue down the path of remote work, we're gonna see for certain occupations, the emergence of a truly global labor market. So five more minutes or three more minutes, Carlos, and then we will start with uh, questions. Adoption of technology. Well, this is yet another trend that has been continuing during this crisis. It's e-commerce, it's remote work, but not only that, also remote play and remote learning 
And I'm hoping, and I'm happy to provide examples later, that technology may help us deal with wasteful consumption and perhaps also with climate change, not simply by exploring new energy sources, but also by helping change the behavior of people. So you have here a simple table that I want to emphasize, given that you're very interested in all of this. Look, the food and beverage sector in the world contributes about 30% of all carbon emissions if you include the transportation cost. But remember, we waste about 25 to 30% of the food that reaches the end consumer. So if we could find a way of reducing that waste, we would be able to cut carbon emissions. So it's not that I'm against systemic change when it comes to climate change. All I'm saying is that there's also a lot of scope for changing individual behavior, especially, by the way, in my next and last topic, which is if we follow the money, which is emerging markets, they're creating a middle class. Let me just show you these uh, projections here that you may have seen. You can also use the IMF projections. Here I'm using the ones from the conference board. Look at mature economies within the uh, red square, the impact that the crisis is going to have on GDP growth, and then their recovery in 2021. And look at all emerging and developing markets, less of an impact in terms of GDP decline, and then more growth afterwards. This means the middle class in emerging markets is going to grow faster relative to the middle class in advanced markets as a result of this pandemic. Now, the middle class likes to have a car. They want to go on vacation. They want a bigger house. They want to have air conditioning in their home. That is the battleground for climate change. How can we persuade the middle class in emerging markets to be less wasteful and more conscious about the environment than the American or the European middle classes have been? So in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to finish in two minutes, Carlos. I have all of these charts that you can also find in the book about the growth of the middle class, the accumulation of wealth at the top, by the way, which continues unabated. But I would like to, as promised, uh, leave you with something that is really important, which is that question. Will globalization be reversed as a result of this crisis? One minute, and then we'll start with Q&A, Carlos. Well, it's OK. You, uh, if you think about uh, globalization from a demographic point of view, I think this pandemic only accelerates the trends. Why? Again, postponement of fertility decisions. That means faster population aging. So if you thought that the social security system of a given country in the world would be un unsustainable by the year 2045, let's say, as a result of this pandemic, now the revised year should be 2040 or 2035 because population aging will accelerate politics i think this pandemic unfortunately will accelerate the trend towards populism and xenophobia it is a global trend it is a globalizing trend as well the economy of course there's going to be a temporary reduction in trade and investment driven by the recession but i do believe that they will recover and more importantly even if we continue down this path, like for example, we saw in remote work, we're gonna see more globalization from the point of view of trade in tasks. And let's not forget that this will be beneficial for some people, but maybe not for others. So therefore, how about social globalization? Well, I think inequality is going to increase both within countries in the world and across countries. That's another globalizing trend. We have been witnessing this for the last 20 years, and this pandemic will only accelerate that. Virtual interconnectivity and technology, of course. I don't think I need to um, expand on that. Uh, public health, the frequency of epidemics that become pandemics. Well, every public health expert is telling you that we either invest in better public health infrastructures around the world, or we're going to see more of these pandemics. Remember. There are thousands of epidemic outbreaks in the world taking place every decade. The WHO has this very well documented. Only a few become pandemics. But the frequency of pandemics may increase in the future. And pandemics, by definition, are global. Geopolitics, I think the rebalancing among Europe, China, the US emerging economies is going to accelerate. Right, That future that we thought in which 
Asia would become the central axis of consumption in the world, that is arriving much faster than we thought. And then finally, we have climate. And of course, uh, you are the experts here, many of you, you're working on this day in and day out. Once again, my message is, of course, this is a global problem. Of course, we need systemic change on the part of governments, on the part of companies. But quite frankly, I think we also need individual change in behavior. And I think the biggest challenge is, can we persuade the middle class, the emerging middle class in emerging markets to be different than the middle class in Europe and the United States, to be less wasteful, to be more conscious of the environment? So let me stop there, Carlos, so that we have uh, at least um, 15 minutes for Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. You have delivered to the expectations and even more. No, it has been a very, very interesting and insightful uh, presentation in which you have mentioned essential points of trends in which uh, we should focus on going forward. No, uh, the last slide that you have presented it seems to me a little bit pessimistic because there are the trends, but. Uh, the, the kind of the conclusion that or the highlight that you have pointed out there, it looks like a challenging uh, environment. No? And I do agree with you completely uh, that uh, change starts by each individual and we need to become agents of change each one of us no so uh, let me uh, let me remind uh, the attendees to please uh, post any questions and we'll get it and get it through uh, to you uh, mauro but i have i have uh, let me start with uh, with uh, with a question here in this uh, scenario that you have described of several key global trends col colliding which one do you think is the most relevant the most impactful where and where is climate change in, in, in this list? Because in my opinion, uh, climate change, uh, it's really uh, impactful. I mean, it's uh, what we are seeing uh, with the COVID crisis is, is only, it's only a, an anticipation of uh, a much uh, more substantial and irreversible damage that uh, can be created by climate change. But anyway, I don't want to influence your, uh, the, <laughs> your rating of those uh, those very important key global trends, no? Uh, which one do you think it's going to be the most impactful, at least in the short term? And where well, we should I, put our scar resources? Well, obviously in the very, very short term, I think uh, the you know, uh, biggest issue is uh, the rise of populism. Populism understood as uh, this idea that uh, uh, experts are wrong and that uh, politicians um, know better what the people need. And it's the distrust of science and the distrust of, uh, in particular, climate science. So I very much hope that um, we can uh, have a change uh, here in the United States in the November election. I really hope that uh, we can also have similar changes at future elections in other parts of the world. I think that would be the most immediate issue, I think, is the distrust of science, the fact that, uh, you know, we have politicians with a lot of power in the world who are essentially saying climate change is a hoax and we shouldn't be acting on it. Uh, but um, I think if you define the middle, I'm sorry, the short run more in terms of one to two years or three years, and then we get into the medium run and the long run, given that the clock is ticking so quickly, I would say is the middle class. The middle class is growing very quickly in emerging markets. And uh, again, the middle class is, has always been defined by consumption. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need to really make sure that that growing middle class in emerging markets doesn't behave in the same way that unfortunately the American, especially the American, but also the European middle classes have behaved in the past. Okay, talking about uh, talking about middle classes, the uh, the globalization and the opening of markets and technological advances that we have seen during the past several years, and in a way they have contributed to commoditize products and services. No, so the consumer, the end consumer, has gained a lot of power, and requesting from companies product differentiation, quality at a very low price, and payment facilities. And in this context, we have seen that those producers like China, for example, obviously have been uh, conquering a big chunk of the of market share in, in the world. No? Is, this, is this being reversed with the current trend? What is going to happen 
For example, you have been studying a lot uh, about the role of multinationals. Are multinationals going to to lose uh, to lose uh, influence in this context uh, in a certain way that we have seen with all these trends? And is the is the uh, as as I mentioned, is the consumer going to continue gaining power or or is going to say, give up uh, that power? What, what is your yeah, opinion? So, uh, that, that's a great question, Carlos. So let me make two points. The first is. Uh, about what's going on right now in the middle of this pandemic, especially in Europe and the United States. As you know, consumption has declined. And even when people have been losing their jobs, getting unemployment benefits, they have been saving more money or they have been reducing their debt, their credit card debt and so on and so forth, right? We have very good data on this, of course, because uh, you know banks report their levels of deposits uh, and also the levels uh, of debt that consumers are carrying. So the first uh, impact of this pandemic has been that people have uh, tended to save more and consume less, right? That's the first uh, uh, thing that I would say. Uh, the second thing is that I have noticed in many surveys, including those conducted, for example, by the Edelman Trust, which I think is something that we can um, you know, have confidence in, in terms of a, a survey that is well done, that it seems as if consumer um, preferences and consumer attitudes, uh, at least in the United States, are changing a little bit as a result of this pandemic. Because this pandemic, at the end of the day, I think, reminds people that our relationship as a human population with the environment is something that is very fragile, uh, that is very, um, you know, uh, important to preserve. Right? Because at the end of the day, a public health crisis is a crisis about how humans relate to the environment and to one another. Right? Um, now, my big question is, are those attitudes, is that change in attitudes going to last? Or if the economy recovers and things go back to some kind of normal, then people are going to go back to their own ways. So I think it's too early to tell. I think, by the way, the only way to reinforce that change in attitudes is if we have in countries around the world the right kind of political leadership. Um, so I think leadership from the top is really important in terms of reinforcing the message. So if there's already change in attitudes on the part of consumers, which we are detecting in surveys, for example, here in the United States, then you need political leaders to reinforce that. But once again, uh, we have way too many nationalist, populist, and protectionist leaders right now in the world. And they are reinforcing precisely the opposite thing, which is that climate change doesn't matter, our relationship with the environment doesn't matter, we can pollute as much as we want, and so on and so forth. So I think it's really important to um, see those changes in popular attitudes being reinforced by the political leadership. Unfortunately, in many important countries in the world right now, that's not what's going on. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, before I hand over to the audience and to my colleague Luis, let me let me make a, a last question from my side, which I think is at, at least is very relevant in IFC's agenda as well. And the thing is that it's a topic that you have also been investigated during the several years, and it's about diversity. And, and the question that I have for you in this in this context, in where where all these trends are revamping somehow, how relevant becomes diversity? Is going diversity going to be reinforced, or is something that is going to be negatively affected? How do you see it, Mar Mauro? Well, I think uh, diversity from a demographic and uh, ethnic and uh, racial point of view. Um, is obviously at the top of the agenda now uh, in several countries around the world, but especially, as you know, in the United States, uh, because the tensions and the frictions have been kept, um, you know, outside of the you know spotlight for too long, and they have been building up, right? So what we're seeing is, you know, it's kind of funny, right? It's a combination of 1919, meaning a pandemic, 1929, which is a severe economic uh, problem. And then 1965 or 1966, meaning uh, a recognition that, um, you know, there's still a problem with civil rights and with discrimination and so on and so forth. Now, again, I think this is an intensification of a trend. Uh, for example, when it comes to gender, 
Well, the Me Too movement started uh, two or three or four years ago, right? Uh, and now uh, racial tensions are becoming more important, especially because of the pandemic. Because as you know, the pandemic is showing unequivocally that, for example, here in the United States, African-Americans and also Hispanics are so much more affected by the consequences. And the reason is very clear. They, have, they don't have enough savings. They don't have as much space in the home. They don't have access to healthcare. And more importantly, they work essential jobs. So they have to take public transportation to uh, work and therefore they're more exposed than you and I are, right? So uh, I think inequality along uh, all of these dimensions is just gonna get worse as a result of this. And therefore politically and socially is gonna become so much more prominent on the agenda. So I think uh, we are going to go through a period in which, unfortunately, I think there's gonna be growing frictions because as you know, uh, there's also a lot of resistance, resistance uh, to diversity. And that is being exploited, unfortunately, by once again, populist politicians in many parts of the world. Uh, so again, you have a societal trend and then you have politicians who can, through their leadership, either send it in the right direction or, you know, make the worst out of it. And I think that's the issue. Um, so um, one ray of hope, I actually see a lot of companies doing much more right now than governments. So I see much more debate within companies uh, or organizations such as yours, the IFC, than, you know, and, and more action, right? Regarding the fact that we need to address this issue because there's something called structural discrimination and uh, it is a long-standing problem. Absolutely, Mauro. Thank you so much. I will continue asking you uh, questions and questions because it's really, really interesting talking to you. But I think it's now time to, to open uh, to our audience uh, for questions. And this is going to be handled by my colleague, uh, Luis Fuente. Uh, Luis is an associate operations officer within our team, Climate Finance LAC, and he supports, and by the way, very well, IFC's advisory work on climate finance for the financial institutions group in, in LAC. So Luis, over to you and, and let us share any questions that we receive from, from our attendees. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you very much, Ma uh, Professor Mauro, for your insightful presentation. I've been, I've been, you know, following it very, very much and, and it has covered many topics. We've been having a, a very active audience, actually, uh, throughout the presentation. I'm going to select uh, some of the questions that the audience uh, have posted, has posted, and one of them is related to the relations between urbanization and, and, and pandemic, right? Uh, uh, a colleague of us is asking us, so analysis and urbanization are linked, resulting in ecological degradation. Therefore, uh, chances of future pandemic will still be high unless we fix the ecological change more than the climate change. Please let us know your thoughts on that specifically. Yes, I think uh, this pandemic has uh, essentially reminded us that um, we need to maybe revisit or rethink some of the assumptions that we were making about agglomerations, big agglomerations of people, right? So I think in the past, we've seen all of the advantages. In fact, um, in the field of economics, as you know, uh, they're called, uh, you know, positive externalities in terms of the agglomeration effects. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we need to, again, find a different balance here and think about what might be some of the disadvantages, including not only climate change, because once again, urban residents are much more energy intensive than uh, residents of other uh, areas. And, um, uh, and also, uh, you know, the potential for the spread of uh, viruses and bacteria and all of that. Um, for me, the solution is actually, you know, something that, you know, Africa has been practicing for a very long time. So in Africa, uh, in African cities, um, I don't know whether people are aware of this, but the World Bank estimates that between 25 and 30 percent of the food consumed in African cities is actually grown within those cities. It's remarkable. Um, now, they don't look like Manhattan. It's very difficult to uh, grow food in Manhattan, I guess, right? But what I'm trying to say is that we need to find a different model for what a city is. Um, and in ways I will contribute to reducing the carbon footprint.
commitment to making the cities more livable and also, also to make them more sustainable. And I, I keep on returning to agriculture, to food and beverages, because once again, they are the biggest contributors to our problems. Uh, because normally we transport them from very long distances and we have to move away from that model. Um, you see, during World War II, here in the United States, we used to have um, the so-called Liberty Gardens. People were growing tomatoes in their backyards, right? I think we may have to go back to that. Uh, in Singapore, they're investing heavily in vertical agriculture, very efficient, many beneficial effects, right? And think about Singapore, how small it is, but Singapore is turning to vertical agriculture. I think it's remarkable. So there are many things that we need to do, but again, the overarching message is we need to fix the cities because um, we know it is the biggest source of problems for climate change. And now we also know that um, we are um, very exposed to uh, epidemic outbreaks becoming pandemics because of cities. Thank you, Mauro. Thank the emerging middle class uh, how can the growing uh, market plan to be environmentally responsible choices uh, to what extent uh, is is this the responsibility of emerging market governments to re to reinforce this message right of of environmentally friendly consuming of resources etc uh, how do we do this yes well um, i'm going to give you an answer that is um, out of self interest i think education I am in the education sector, uh, but beyond education, uh, we can use two other very important tools. So one is incentives, okay? And the other one is nudging. So nudging, as you know, involves, you know, framing the situation in such a way that uh, we uh, invite people to do the right thing for the environment without necessarily giving them their money. In my book, uh, I go over many examples of how both nudging and incentives can be used. Uh, to try to reduce the problem of um, of uh, you know our carbon footprint, but let me just give you one very quickly, which is all of that food that we waste, right? So we recycle our automobiles. We have pre-owned vehicle markets, right? Um, but we don't recycle our food if uh, you know before we throw it away at home. Um, there are apps now, um, part of the sharing economy, that are trying to encourage people to share food before it goes to waste. Uh, because once again, we waste between 25 and 30% of the food that reaches the end consumer. The same with clothing. Clothing contributes about 10, 12, 15% of carbon emissions, everything considered. We waste a lot of clothes and we do not recycle clothes and we do not buy secondhand clothing. Culturally, we don't want to do that. We buy secondhand cars, pre-owned vehicles, but not clothing. So I think uh, through education, through nudging, and through incentives, and also through technology, especially sharing economy technology, we may be able to change the way in which the middle class behaves. Uh, but I think it's easier to do that with the emerging middle class because they're now becoming middle class. I think it's easier to do it with them than it will be, unfortunately, especially with the American middle class. Because the American middle class is terrible. It's all about waste. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, another question related to technology. Uh, Fabrice is asking us uh, on the automation of work in the services industry that you mentioned before in your presentation. Could you kindly elaborate with examples for, uh, on this on this topic specifically? Uh, so it's about uh, how to change. Uh, uh, oh well, uh, remote work uh, obviously uh, you know eliminates the need of, of commuting. Uh, so this will have, of course, you know, in principle, very beneficial effects on climate change, uh, but also the air quality and so on and so forth. Even if we go back to working one uh, uh, or two days uh, or three days a week at the office and uh, one or two days at home, it will have some positive impact. So I think remote work is uh, or should be part of the solution to climate change. But I think 100% remote work, you know, five days a week, I think that is unsustainable. We're starting to see the limits, um, you know, and especially for families that have kids, it's extremely difficult for them. Right. And uh, another question regarding artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, these sort of uh, disruptions 
that we're facing right now in in the technology space uh, how the does those uh, th do those uh, technologies will play a fundamental role in the development of of the economies in a post pandemic role i would say right yeah. yeah, I think uh, obviously artificial intelligence when it comes to uh, automation and when it, when it comes to the use of information. I would also like to add to that list the blockchain. I think it's going to be really, really important. And in the book, I have several examples as to how we can use the blockchain and cryptocurrencies to promote pro-environmental behavior. Uh, in other words, to try to induce people to be more environmentally friendly in their consumption. You see, I don't think cryptocurrencies will work if they're just a substitute for money. I think cryptocurrencies will work if they're part of the blockchain and you embed in it incentives and other kinds of uh, you know, mechanisms for uh, people to change their behavior so that we can uh, address problems as, uh, as, as big as climate change. Thank you, Mauro. And one question that is very interesting. Do you, do you think... Uh this labor market will contribute to a greater wealth gap, more efficient wealth transfer. What do you think on that? Well, I think um, a global labor market will probably reduce inequality between countries, across countries, but it may increase it within countries. Let me explain. As I said earlier, highly qualified workers with unique skills, lots of experience, they will benefit from remote work. Right, because their services will be required by not just companies in their country, but all over the world, and they will uh, they will have to move. However, workers that don't have those units are going to suffer. So I think inequality within countries, at least in the short term, will increase as a result of continuing remote work and trading tasks. However, I think this will be an opportunity for some developing countries to catch up because they have really good people, and now that we're going to have less immigration. Um, maybe they will be able to find jobs uh, and perform them remotely without migrating. And of course, they will be making money, right? And that money will be flowing to those economies. So it's too early to fully anticipate what may happen. But once again, I think a re probably a reduction in inequality across countries, but also probably an increase in inequality within countries. Thank you, Professor. I think we're running out of time, and so I'm going to pass the word to Carlos. Over to Carlos. Thank you so much, Mauro, for answering your, all the questions. Well, thank you, Luis. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, and thanks to our participants, and especially thanks to Mauro. Thank you very much, Professor Guillén, for sharing with us your vast knowledge and insightful opinions. In fact, I think it was a success to, to have a closing webinar for our series, to have you on board and give me, giving us this overview of what is happening. We have discussed major global trends and COVID crisis, climate change, urbanization, demography, remote work, trading tasks and absorbing strength of balance of power, consumers, uh, the emerging middle class, change of attitudes, at the end, the world is going through a major, major changes. And I think that never before than now, our webinar series title becomes relevant, Control the Future for Best Options. Out between the several options, choose. Let's aim at choosing the best option, those that help to strengthen sustainability of resources, those that promote diversity, those that integrate and lessons learned, and those that at the end of the day reduce inequality. To run up this webinar, we need to apply lessons learned during this crisis caused by COVID-19 to rebuild a more dynamic and resilient society, achieving a more competitive economy. We really hope that we have been useful to our attendees. We had 2,600, not in this webinar, but in, in the, in, during these past 12 webinars, from four continents connecting, and we will continue, hopefully after the summer break, with new ideas and knowledge sharing to accelerate the green banking agenda and as a key element for a more sustainable world. I wish you all an uh, excellent summer within the circumstances. Stay safe. All the best for you and your families. And thanks to everyone, and especially to my team, for having supported uh, through this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mauro, and we'll talk soon. 
And everyone, please remind that the new book from Mauro Guillén will be on the market on August 25, and it's going to, to be very, very interesting. I think it's almost 300 pages. I started to read the, 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 a copy that Mario Mauro sent me last night, and I call, I keep on calling you Mario because we have a Mario in the team, but it's Mauro, Mario and Mario. Mauro and Mario. So thanks, Mauro, very much. Wish you all the best and thank to all of you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Gracias all. Thank you. Gracias. Chao, Luis. Chao.